I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. My goal is at least 20 people with an AR-15 and a couple tracer rounds. I think I can do a good time. Location is Stone Douglas in Parkland, Florida. All right. So uh, here's the plan. I'm gonna go take Uber in the afternoon before 2:40. From there, I'll go into the uh, to school campus, walk up the stairs, load my bags, and get my AR and shoot people down at the main was it the main courtyard. In this classroom, screams of anguish as police lead students to safety. <laughs> as an ordinary school day, and it was almost over when gunfire erupted this afternoon. 17 people killed in a mass shooting at a Florida high school. One of the deadliest mass shootings in American history. She was sending us texts, like saying, I love you, I'm sorry, and all that, because she didn't think she was gonna make it. President Trump, you say, what can you do? You can stop the guns from getting into these children's hands. The teacher would have a concealed gun on them, they'd go for special training, and you would no longer have a gun-free zone. Welcome to the revolution. It is a powerful and peaceful one because it is of by and for the young people of this country. Since this movement began, people have asked me, do you think any change is gonna come from this? Look around, we are the change. My generation, having spent our entire lives seeing mass shooting after mass shooting, has learned that our voices are powerful and our votes matter. teachers doesn't make the situation better. You know, we know that adding more guns to a situation doesn't save any lives. The good man with a gun is a myth. died in the first half of this year than died in the landing at D-Day. You know, more Americans died in the first half of this year. That's insane. That's crazy. And people just don't realize it because they don't see it in the same way that we see a war. It doesn't impact them the same way. Good afternoon, family. Yes, I said family. Our pain makes us family. Us hurting together brings us closer together to fight for something better. Uh, my name is Alex King. I'm 17. I am a senior at North Lundale College Prep. Uh, as well as a peace warrior and a leader with Good Kids Mad City. Chicago has been at the forefront of gun violence for a very long time. With 
650 people being murdered in the year of 2017 and 771 being murdered in the year of 2016. But that's not it. Gun violence travels in places like Florida, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles. It happens nationwide. I know many, I know many people who have lost loved ones, friends and family on a regular basis due to gun violence. Nah, it's gonna take me a little longer. We gotta go around. Somebody got shot up here uh, by Skips. Yeah, uh, banger, right? Yeah, they got it blocked off. We can't get through. I'm about to try to come around. Uh, all kind of some. I don't know. I'm about to see if we can get around. Good Kids Mad City was created last year, so in the spark of um, what happened in Parkland, Florida. After um, the shooting happened, gun violence then became like this national emergency that everyone cared about. And so the young people were like, this is gonna be bad for us because whenever, historically, whenever these mass shootings happen in these white schools, they get the attention, they get money, they get trauma services, they get grievance counselors, and we're gonna get more gun laws and we're gonna get more police in our schools and in our communities, like like we're the ones doing this thing. And we've been fighting for for against gun violence for years and we're not getting any attention. So their thing was we want to make sure that since now this is important to everybody, we want to make sure we're not left out of the conversation. And a lot of organizing is youth led, is led by young people leading the way because they're the ones fighting for the next generation. In 2018, when the Parkland shooting happened, I decided that I needed to go out and actually take some action. So at that point, I took some friends together and organized a statewide march against the NRA and against a local organization in Colorado, my home state, uh, called the RMGO, Rocky Mountain, Rocky Mountain Gun Owners Association. Um, and they are you know, terrible for perpetrating this idea that guns are vital to our community and that we can't live a life without them, when in actuality that's just not true. And really having as many as we do just puts more people at danger. There's a real culture around guns and gun ownership. Americans, you know, look back on this very rosy-eyed image from the 1700s when we rose up against our oppressors and, you know, threw off the colonial control of Great Britain with our, you know, musket men and our regular people, everyday people who all came together and fought back. It's this very idealized image of, you know, this older America. And that feeling pervades today where we feel like if we can personally own firearms, if the Second Amendment allows us to personally, each of us, own a firearm, then it's going to somehow protect us from governments taking over control, somehow make us stronger and safer. Um, and it makes Americans, you know, look past the deaths that happen every single day, the 100 people who die, the 200 who are injured every day, and say, it's fine. We need to be able to own these because we need to be able to say that we're somehow safe from our government. But does anyone have any questions about the bills that we're going to be talking about today? If you see on the right side of your folder, um, you'll see there are two one-pagers, one on extreme risk law and the other on um, the CDC funding. After I finished organizing the event in Colorado and leading all of those students in Colorado, I moved to D.C. to start college. And when I came here, there was no March for Our Lives presence. There was no organizational presence. And so with a couple of friends, I got together and we founded the first March for Our Lives chapter here in D.C. We set up the infrastructure. Like every year, the government spends so much money on so many things. Like it's about sitting there and figuring out, it's about deciding what's a priority when 40,000 people are being killed 
every year by something, and we aren't, we can't come to a bipartisan consensus on what is going to help solve that. And we've seen the CDC has done comparable effective research that's then been able to save lives. kids my age, um, bullets don't have a name on it, and there's different gang battles and wars going on. It's a war zone. Um, and people would get revenge at the little kids just to get even with the older guys and things of that such. And people would use the little kids just to get even with the older guys. So it's like, no matter what age you are, they you've been a target. They, they coming at you, and it, it's a shame, it's sad. Uh, I, I have plenty of friends that lost their life. Um, I keep I keep this right here. I lost a friend uh, that played basketball, so I got I, I keep this like as motivation. I always keep it right here, just right here. Um, Del Monte, I keep him right there, just to like these type of things keep me motivated and give me that passion to remember what I, what am I doing it and who I'm doing it for and the reason why I'm doing it. Like when we lost Del Monte, it wasn't a reason for us to hang our heads or be defeated and things like that. It just gave us a, that fire that we need and the passion. That's why when y'all ask me like, why do I keep the heart right here, the broken heart, is because everybody go through heartbreaks and things of, of that such. And I don't let my heartbreak break me. I, I wear my heartbreaks now. I, I wear it and I, I strengthen it now. And it's something that I look at and, and I overcome it now. Last night, 19-year-old Domonte Johnson was just outside his brother's basketball practice near Euclid and 86th Street when CPD says someone inside a tan-colored vehicle fatally shot him in the chest and stomach. It's not fair that so many black and brown kids have to worry about being shot on their way to school or on their way home from school. I just want peace, heal the land. We losing too many of our babies. Every time you turn around, mamas is crying. Mamas is crying for their babies. Johnson's family says he was putting together a fundraiser to help children go to Christian camp and worked with advocacy group Good Kids Mad City, helping to stop the violence that killed him. Good Kids Mad City was created to keep the urban narrative alive. They're talking about violence and lack of what do we need for us to be able to thrive and grow. One solution to the issue. So just trying to create new new laws isn't gonna gonna stop us from you know from feeling what what we're going against when it comes to violence. At Sherwood, uh, but we're doing the training at uh, on 83rd and Damon. So uh, actually, we got about maybe 20, 25 kids that'll be there. All right. So we're gonna do the icebreaker. Once, hear me clap twice. Hear me say shh. Come on, guys, let's go join the rest of the team. My name is Carlyle Pittman. I'm the co-founder of Good Kids Mad City, Inglewood, born and raised, Chicago all my life. The purpose of what we're doing here today is basically in the, the climate of the neighborhoods that we come from, we experience a lot of violence, a lot of shootings happening sometimes. Unfortunately, young people are around to see those things, or young people are the victims of those things happening. And so what we took the leisure of doing is educating ourselves and educating our community, because a lot of times we are the first responders. They say ambulance are the first responders, but a lot of times a friend or a family member or a brother or sister is there when, when something tragic happens. And what do you do in that situation? So my first question is, how long do you think an ambulance could take to get to the scene? Go ahead, DJ. Can you speak up? 45 minutes to an hour. Anybody else got an answer? 15 to 30 minutes. Okay. So the estimate arrival time is 25 to 30 minutes. Do everybody know how much blood is in a human body? Josh? 4.5 Okay. 
So it's about 4.5 liters, which is about, if you want to see it visually, that's two pops, two liter pops. So how long do you think it takes for us to bleed out? Go ahead. Okay, anybody else have an answer for me? Some ladies in the back. Y'all can guess. It can be wrong. It's okay. So many. Okay, anybody else? You got an answer? <laughs> All right, so on the average, it takes a person about seven minutes to bleed out. Depending on where they got hit or what artery was hit, it could take one minute. So if it takes the ambulance 25, 30 minutes in predominantly black and brown communities, and it takes a human being seven minutes to bleed out, by the time they get there, they already bled out to death. So that's why this trend is important, because in situations like that, we need our people that are around us to be able to help somebody and save somebody's life. It's not guaranteed that you can save that person's life, but for you doing something, for you trying, you definitely can. I've lost a lot of people in my life, and I see if I knew this trend a couple years ago, I probably could save somebody's life, because I've seen a lot of people get killed in front of me. Like Carlio said, as soon as that person is hit, the clock is ticking. They're already bleeding. So back to that person, if you had to perform CPR. All right, so when you're on your wrist, there's two sides. You could be look underneath your pinky. You can look underneath your thumb. If it's underneath your neck, it's underneath your chin bone. And if you move down, you can see like down your throat, you'll feel it underneath there a little lower. It'll be behind your knee. You can check it so there's different places because sometimes the, the wrist is a hard, tricky spot to find the pulse. After you find the pulse, you want to start performing the compressions. Just recently had a death on um, April 15th. My brother Edward passed away. He was shot in front of his house. Bullets don't have names and we can't pick and choose, you know, we just got to learn how to deal with the situation. And I know a lot of people say like it will get better, it will get easier, and it really doesn't. You just, you, you learn how to deal with the situation better each and every day. The people that have lost to gun violence, I probably can count on both my hands and more. So it would be a lot for me to name people. I've lost people from various ages as up to like seven to like 35, you know. I've lost people back to back in the same year. Um, and it's something nowadays like I just expect to lose somebody. And I just, you know, I try to keep my head up, you know, and just hope for the best. But it's kind of just now becoming normal. Okay. Is he unconscious? How do you know he's unconscious? Pause. So he, he so he unconscious. He does have a pulse. And the next thing you do is start pumping. Compress, thirty press, because he's not unconscious. He don't have a pulse. But it's blood all over this concrete. Personally, I know it's not normal. Like, you know, that's stuff that happens because it's not supposed to be. Like, when you hear gunshots, you're supposed to be scared. You're not You're supposed to want to call the cops, you know. When someone dies, it's, it's supposed to be very heartbreaking. But in where I'm from and where I grew up at, like, if you hear gunshots, the kids still play. Like, they still play outside. We still didn't finish enjoying our time, you know. And it's because they just normalize it. Like, it happens so often that people use it as if, like, oh, I just got a scrape on the knee. Like, it, it was just nothing. I heard there was this, um, this joke someone told one time. Well, they said that Chicago is the only place where a young person can be dodging bullets on their way to school and still get marked tardy and get a detention when they get to school for being late. And it was funny, but it was so it was so serious. Like, it it wasn't like a ha ha funny. It was like a that's messed up because I believe it, uh, kind of thing. And they get to school and, and don't even talk about what happened on their way there. So I I, I think that it, it's 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 a skill. That coping mechanism is a skill. Understanding how, how these things are so serious and and just just being able to to walk through every day like nothing happened. Like there's so much that someone can go through before they even make it to school in the morning. We also, somebody can talk about the Army teachers stuff. Uh, and ask them. Yeah, it's, well, we don't, have a, we don't have a one yeah. job, but we do have the resolution. Okay. Oh, and then I have, the I stole this cool graph from, from JP, so we can use that. Gun violence affects every 
minority population, every vulnerable population in America. And because of that intersection and how, how much it affects so many different people and so many different groups of people, we've been able to build a really strong coalition and also reach out to all of those um, young people who recognize that one day they inevitably will become impacted by gun violence. Gun violence isn't just gun violence. Gun violence is systemic, um, you know, issues, systemic racism, systemic, you know, sexism. It's about, you know, the populace. It's about voting rights. It's about, you know, LGBTQ rights. It's about the right to walk down the street and walk to class and not have to be afraid of a stray bullet hitting you and killing you or your friend or your brother or whoever it is. I mean, it's about the right to have a future. Hey, do you have a minute? You said you'd be coming, you'd be going into the meeting at two? Okay, I'll give you a text. Thanks, mate. See you later, man. Bye. That we're kids is our biggest strength and our biggest weakness. Definitely the fact that we are young people and that we do have such a strong moral compass and we feel things so fiercely and so quickly and we act on it and we're not afraid to speak up has always been our strongest suit, has always been um, the thing that has made us different. You know, we're not afraid to take those strong chance, um, stances and to call people out. Um, here in D.C., we have students going to Congress literally every single day and lobbying these members of Congress. We have like 10 minutes left. When I started, I had death threats. When I started, I had people, you know, pushing me down. The thing I didn't do at that point was stop. I continued to push forwards. I got my friends together and we went back. I got more friends together and we went back again. And that's what it takes. It takes the realization that these adults, these people who are older than me, don't know it. They don't know what's going on because what's going on right now isn't okay. And they're the ones, they're the reason that it's still this way. The unique thing about March for Our Lives is that the, the adults are afraid of us, quite frankly. Members of Congress are very afraid of us. Um, and that's something we know and we definitely use to our advantage. Uh, we're able to get meetings with people who quite literally will never vote in favor of any gun violence prevention bill. But they're afraid to not be with us because they don't want to see what would happen if we were to call them out for not taking our meeting. Okay. Um, but 187 total instances, 38 deaths, 93 injuries, and then um, 15 teenagers killed or injured, three children, zero to 11. <laughs> Not offended. <laughs> We'd go into these rooms with these senators and with these House members, and they'd be surprised because we were these young faces who had experienced gun violence, not myself, my friends, and bringing them into those rooms, suddenly these senators didn't have the same kind of talking points which they normally had. They couldn't just shout us down. Hi, JP. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Amelia. Amelia, nice to meet you. Um, so, I don't know if Lauren talked to you. We were powerful, and seeing that, and seeing that young people could really affect that room, just showed me that across issues, across spaces, across the nation, we need young people to be able to stand up and actually make their voices heard because they have an impact and they have a real measurable impact.
like a like a father, big brother. I'm, I'm that I'm that figure, that that extra voice um, that that they might not be getting in between, like the, the younger kids and the adults. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of my time with the young people, whether it's taking them to go eat, going to play uh, basketball, they come to my house, they play games. And they also, I educate them and, you know, bring them together around issues that are affecting them in their community. Try to empower them to take lead, to speak at one of these events, to run one of these events, uh, to, to be in front of the march. Just, just, just showing them that they are capable of starting their own movement. They're definitely connected, the two sides of the same coin. I think in order for you to, to see real change, there t it takes building that relationship. There are different levels of relationship that, that have to occur when you're trying to make, make real change. So it's one thing for us to be on the grounds, be grassroots, be on the field, but there's no mandate that's helping us to, to do those things. So I think having the right people who have those connections, you need that. Uh, and you need that to work together. You need folks who are actually in, in the field, who are living this on an everyday basis, trying to make a difference, and the folks who are able to reach those in the power, that have the power to write laws, to, to, to give resources, to, to send funds to these communities that need it. Good afternoon, everybody. So before we get started, I know we're all noticing how the young people behind me are wearing red tape across their mouths with words on it. And just to show that represents either a powerful word, quote, or a, a loved one that they lost to gun violence while, while in the fight. Two-year-old Dekayla Dansbury was killed May 15, 2016. She was my friend. 22-year-old Edward James was killed on April 15, 2019. He was my brother. 19-year-old Delmonte Johnson was killed on September 5th, 2018. He was my brother. Losing Delmonte was a breaking point for me. He was a young person we lost in Good Kids, Mad City. I didn't know how to move forward, but the young people were resilient. They knew he was someone who wanted to make a difference, and they didn't let that death go in vain. Yeah, I really miss my baby, you know, so he's here with me. I got you, Del Monte. Yep. Yeah, I got to mentally prepare myself, mentally really prepare myself because, you know, I still sit and like I hear, you know, the certain things, you know, I sit up and wait on them, you know, I can hear them. Ma, Ma, you know, I can hear him through my window calling me. So, I mean, I still have to deal with these certain things. You know, his little memories, because like you say, he's still here with me. You know, just happy, strong, and get through the day, because I can come and sit down and talk to him. Maybe not in a physical form, you know, but spiritually. I know he got me. I always say, Mama, I'm going to make you happy. I'm going to make you happy. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm going to make you happy. Okay, go to school, graduated, and he did. He did just that, graduated out of high school, everything, got on a job. Yeah, so, you gotta get ready for you, son. Gotta get ready. Let's think about you. Think about you.
Yeah, right there's perfect. Hey, what was that? All right. Here you go, sir. Thank you. You too. This bench is one of thousands and thousands of benches over thousands and thousands of years. Some bench has fallen logs or ledges of slate or edges straight from manufacturers of all kinds of benches, where people come to convene, cuddle, remember, forget, resist, settle, rest, reset. This bench is somewhere on the eastern seaboard of the United States of America. It's a bench I walk by every day and I hear rah, 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 until one day I tune in and I hear the most beautiful vulgar poetry I've ever heard in my life. That's right, that's today, October 7th, 2019. I saw the Wall Street Journal on a bench left behind by an investment banker. At night, a woman experiencing homelessness used the news as her pillow and a blanket. She spread the business tech sections across her legs, politics across her breasts. She adjusted her head on life and arts and used the bench itself as a bed sized for a queen. I saw a full life living death, her dying breath alive in her chest, an obit orbit, a human worn and wary, a body left behind, an untold obituary, a journal, an unrecorded life on a bench. See where we are? Right there. Where's the rescue mission? Right there. No, San Pedro and Six here. Ready? We're gonna come up on the back of it right now. Can you see our room? Count the floors. Count one, two, three, four. We're on the fourth floor. Which one do you think is our room? Yes. Over there? Almost there. You remember this? Hi there. Hello. Good. What is it? How are you? There it is. So this is where we used to live at the Union Rescue Mission. This is the front door. Yeah, we stayed here eight months. Um, at first, uh, there were so many families, women and children here, that we stayed in the day room, which is basically like a large dining room, large cafeteria style setting, linoleum floors. Um, it looks like a gymnasium, um, but we had air mattresses and slept on the floor for the first couple of months. Um, so from September until December. 
And then in December, we were placed into a room. And because my daughter was with me and not my son, it was just me and one child, I was sharing a room with four other mothers who all had one child with them at the time. Are you ready? Either me or Jackie or both of us go uh, to LA every afternoon. This is about 75 miles, 80 miles from our home. But the longest distance is when we do Venice and Santa Monica. That takes at least an hour and 45 minutes to get there. We do this uh, five nights a week, Monday through Friday. Monday, it's Skid Row in downtown, and Tuesday, it's Hollywood. Wednesday is South Central LA, and Thursday is Venice uh, and Santa Monica. Friday is, again, downtown in the Civic Center area, uh, Union Station area. The way we have designed our program uh, is to serve them wherever they are. Don't ask them any questions. Don't judge them. That's very important. How they ended up being on the street, it's not our job to judge them. Nobody likes to be on the street, sleeping on the pavements with the traffic running around in a totally unsanitary conditions. That's nobody's wish to be that way. There's a million reasons why people become homeless. It's not always mental illness and it's not always drug addiction. Yes, those are two, um, I think those are two reasons that have a really negative connotation. So it's easy to say only crazy people become homeless. And it's easy to say only addicts and drug users become homeless. That's never gonna happen to me and my family. But the truth is in the United States, most people are a paycheck or two away. They're, they're one, um, unpaid credit card away. You know, they're one payday loan away. Um, they're one unexpected pregnancy away. Um, they're one job loss away. There's so many reasons why you could end up homeless and unable to pay your bills and unable to keep a roof over your head and your family's head. Lots of people leave the foster care system and have nowhere to go. You turn 18 years old and you are out. That's it. You go from having no parents and just a foster family to being on the street. All of a sudden you're 18, it's like you're an adult, figure it out. living on the street, when you are an unsheltered person, when you have nowhere else to go and you have nothing to look forward to, I really think that I can understand how easy it must be to slip into drug use and to then fall into addiction. Because if you've just got nothing else good going on in your day and you need something to make you feel good, I can't imagine that there's, you know, I can't imagine that much else is gonna make you feel good at that point. When you've hit rock bottom, it's like, it is what it is, I don't know. So, okay. As an immigrant coming from India, it was very, very hurtful to me because I've seen poverty over there. But it bothered me here to see these homeless people 
who were raised here, born here, such a wealthy country of the world, the wealthiest country of the world, and yet these people are going through trash cans uh, to survive. We have a program called Share a Meal. We basically uh, take food, hot meals to the homeless wherever they are on the street of Los Angeles. On an average, we serve about 150 to 200 hot meals a night. We make it a point that we don't have them form a line. If somebody comes to the truck, fine, because you know, line, in my opinion, is kind of a dehumanizing it. That's not the idea that we started with. We wanted to give dignity is the big thing with us. While they're setting up the table and getting this water out of the way, we need to check on that. Wow. Oh, my God. Both the volunteers as well as them receive something. I would like to say that volunteers receive more than what they are giving. With a napkin. We might be passing on a few bucks worth of burrito or food or some uh, donations of clothing or sanitary hygiene kits, but in return, as a volunteer, what you get is an experience of compassion, and that compassion cannot be taught. Compassion can only be experienced, and you can't put a value onto that. That's priceless. I was basically faced with that situation where the apartment manager knew I didn't have any way to pay immediately. Um, but when I told her I was going to start working and I had family that would cover the rent until then, it didn't matter to her. She said um, that she knew I was going to go back to him that um, she'd seen it happen hundreds of times before where um, women claim that they're being abused and then they run right back to the man that they're alleging abuse against. And she didn't want to deal with that drama and she thought it was better if I just moved out. The manager gave me a deadline to leave before she filed the eviction paperwork. And so I left um, because I knew it was just gonna be that much harder to find an apartment if I had an eviction on my record. Um, but the day that I left the apartment, I really, I did not have anywhere to go. I had a little bit of money from my aunt, and so I went and booked a hotel room. Um, I find a piece of phone. And I was um, staying in hotel rooms by myself, or like if I didn't have enough money, I would sleep in my car. Um, and I would try to, like, like I had packed up and put everything into storage, but I didn't really know how I was gonna pay this storage bill. Like, how am I gonna pay, um, you know, to keep the kids' clothes and their toys and things like that? And so I started selling things out of the storage unit to keep the storage unit. Um, and then going and selling blood plasma. 
I was working um, doing online transcription. Um, so that was piece rate. It was very, very small sums of money. I might work all day and make, you know, $15. I had never been on welfare before. I had never been on assistance before. I think I, I had unemployment when I'd lost jobs in the past, but I had never gotten food stamps. I had never gotten any of that. And to go from having had a job since I was 13 years old to being in a motel wondering how I'm going to get $40, to find somewhere for me and my kids to sleep. It was like an impossible, momentous. I just had no comprehension of how do I get to a homeless shelter? So that whole process was from May 15th of 2017. And when we moved into a domestic violence shelter, it was July 3rd. So all those months were in motel rooms or sleeping in the car. We go to the streets, wherever they are, serve them, make them feel that their fellow human beings, that people in their communities care for them. Burritos, water. Do any burritos left? I'm just gonna start saying water. <laughs> That's the start point, rebuilding the trust or the connection that they have lost with the humanitarian compassion. Um, refill if you need to. Who needs burritos and water? Yeah, put it like Burritos are? I don't know what these are. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's spicy, is that okay? Yeah, okay. Thank you, guys, thank you. Water? Okay. You see the flashy city in front of you? We are two blocks from the, all the wealth of LA. And this is where we are, pretty much in the slums, a block and a half. I know so many vibrant, beautiful, homeless people. And there's this saying that homelessness is a temporary condition. Um, it's not, it's something that you experience. It's a phase of your life, but it's not who you are. You don't say, I am a homeless. You say, hi, I am homeless right now. I won't be forever. I wasn't before and I won't be forever. You say we're lost? Yeah. No. I've yeah. got a map. We're not lost. Yeah, but we don't know where we're going. I know where we're going. What? Okay. 
throw it in the basket. I want to do a big bow. Okay, that's hot? Yeah. Okay, can you steer me? Can we go through the aisle here? Thank you, Frankie. Thank you, helper. I've never been homeless my entire life uh, until a year and a half ago. I am on the street. I live on the street. Uh, I'm not sad. Uh, I'm actually happy. Uh, I work every day towards my dream. Uh, I don't look at anything as hopeless. I just happen to live on the street. I haven't found uh, enough consistent income for me to have a place to live or somebody to stay with. And improvisation is what we're doing and we've been talking about this for a while improve is in there we're improving we're starting with nothing with only what we've got we're improving <laughs> take the topic of homelessness Josh go ahead all right here we go, with the use of the topic homelessness. So we're moving around, right? Moving around. With the topic of homelessness, we are going to present a piece that we call Stop and Go. Well, homelessness seems to occur everywhere. They try to go with it and, you know, live in a lot of people don't realize, I think that word has a lot of uh, shame or guilt or something surrounding it that, hopeless. You know, I've heard the term homeless, not hopeless. A lot of people hear that word and it's, it, it's not their fault. They just think that they can't do stuff because of that word. This isn't the life I chose. This isn't what I wanted. It's like everything went at once, all at once. First it was my job, then it was my family, then it was my savings. I have nothing. I have nothing, and it's not like I don't try. I look for resources, I look for jobs, I look for everything I can to make this pass. And all I end up doing is passing time. Every day, recycling. Every day, knocking on the door of some church. But I want more than this. Someone told me there was more than this. Oh my God, I am so tired of the smell of urine everywhere. I can't get away from it. Somebody give me some Lysol or something. It's not enough. There's lice and there's on the street everywhere and trash. Somebody get me out of this place. And we're not going to leave any food on the ground. But if someone is sleeping, we at least want to leave a water for them by their tent. And uh, if the women would please take the uh, feminine product because uh, that makes more sense. I think there's a bag for everybody now, more or less, right? Okay? All right. Excuse me. Yes. Looks like we're good. All left. We don't know who Jesuits. Okay, let's go. It'd be a nice thing to give away. I remember everybody's name and their favorite thing to do in summer. What Chair Meal dedicated itself to is at least let's not have people starve or become dehydrated on the street. There is no such solution other than to educate people that these are somebody's son, daughter, brother, father, mother uh, who are on the street. 
we need to give them a hand to get them off. In uh, one of the 193 neighborhoods. The best donuts in Los Angeles. The best donuts in Los Angeles is on Skid Row. <laughs> Skid Row donuts. <laughs> You're thinking way too much. And it's obvious that this group has been like Eric shaking his head. We don't think in here. It's okay. It's okay. We get out of our heads. We trust our instincts, our guts, our stories. Don't think, don't think. Sometimes I look homeless, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I tell people, if I told people I was on the street before, they say, ah, you don't look like it. But I am. Uh, uh, I have a smile on my face. I'm happy. I'm excited. And I'm happy because I'm doing, I'm living. I'm living. I'm not making any excuses. Uh, uh, I have things, interests I'm in, and I pursue all of them. You're very welcome. People should not be on the street in the richest country in the world. Probably a gang initiation or something like that. We have some uh, food and water. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Have a burrito, please. One burrito. You got the spicy one? Yeah, one spicy one. Okay. You're very welcome. Okay, you too. So long. I have a strong faith, believe in God. Uh, I go to church. I read the Bible a lot. Uh, I keep my head focused on the bigger picture. I pray, constantly pray. I do things for other people, that's a big one. Shoes are too tight. Jimmy got me these shoes free from the Salvation Army. They're too tight. Where are you heading, Johnny? Where are you heading, buddy? Yeah, I'm over there by the church. Over by the church, huh? Yeah. Right on. You get your corn on the cob? Yeah, I got my corn on the cob. Yeah, baby. All right, on. How are you doing, buddy? I'm good, good. How's everything going tonight? Tonight's a nice night. Sitting on the bench. Huh? Sitting on the bench. You got Good it. Little stories, huh? Right on, Johnny. Thanks go. again, buddy. Take care. Love you. Have a great night. All right. Sweet guy. I try and help people. If there's one thing you should do when you're on the street. If you want to get better, if you want to feel better, you got to do something for other people. you got to find some way to serve people. Uh, if you have skills, use your skills and what you have to help people. You can press that button. Do you want to join us for prayer circle? Yeah, yeah. Do whatever you can to help to be of service to people. And that's why I think I'm so happy. One of the reasons I'm always sharing. Uh, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this evening. In Jesus' name, we ask you to bless us and fill us with the Holy Spirit. We're gathered here under your roof, Father God. We ask you to uplift us, to guide us at all times, Father God, to help us stay up and aware of your presence. Guide us in all our ways, Father God. Keep out any negativity and fill us with positivity. Fill us with love, joy, hope, and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
I saw a full life living death, her dying breath alive in her chest, an obit in orbit, a human worn and weary, a body left behind, an untold obituary, a journal, an unrecorded life on a bench. Message received today, 10.45 a.m. Hola, mi nombre es Josué Molina. Estaba llamando para averiguar algo sobre los ADN, pero todavía no hemos tenido ninguna respuesta. Mi número de teléfono es... Message 3. received today. Soy Marina Funes. Estoy buscando a mi cuñado. Él venía para Estados Unidos y no sé qué ha pasado con él porque él nunca llegó y lo dejaron tirado muy seguro y lo estamos buscando estamos muy preocupados hace un mes por favor ayúdeme a encontrar a mi familiar When the historians begin to write this chapter of American history, it's going to be a very sad chapter, a very shameful chapter that we didn't treat our neighbors right. That we made a mistake. Buenos días, eh, ¿cómo está? Muy bien, gracias. Mire, le tengo una pregunta. Quería saber si usted sabe uh, cuándo... Tengo entendido que la mamá de Johnny dijo que él se fue en enero de Nicaragua. ¿En el video? Sí. Ok, ¿esa es una fecha correcta? Sí, es una fecha correcta. Uh -huh. En agosto del 2018, mire, ¿y sabe de la información dental de él si le tenía alguna corona? No, dice que no, que tenía dientes. Completos, ok. Ok, ¿y sabe si andaba identificación o las identificaciones las tiene la familia? Sí, las identificaciones las andaba él. Ok. Esas son fotos que él mandó. Ok, muchísimas gracias. Buenas tardes. Gracias. 
Hi, uh, good morning, Dr. Hess. This is Mirza. Good, how are you doing? Um, I just wanted to let you know that we just received a missing person report from somebody that... It's from Nicaragua. Uh -huh. um, just in case you have seen somebody with his description, he is um, 22 years old okay. and between 66 and 67 inches tall. Um, the only distinctive feature that he has is a tattoo in his forearm. With the name uh, Maria del Socorro. Yes, uh, I don't know which arm is because um, the family can't remember, but... Yeah, that's the only thing that he has. He doesn't have any fractures or dental work. Uh -huh. He was feeling okay. He was just traveling with a group and he came back to try to help uh, pregnant women and uh, older guys. And that's the last time that they saw him. I found this can somewhere in the desert last Tuesday. Todo lo que le pongo las cruces lo encontró en el desierto. Que lleva ya parte del DNA de la persona que comió de ese de esa lata. Entonces ya esa cruz lleva algo sagrado hasta cierto punto. Las cruces que yo hago no son religiosas, solamente son un Un, una marca donde alguien murió, una marca que tiene muchas ramificaciones y repercusiones porque esa persona muere y entonces esa muerte causa un, un gran evento en la familia de esa persona. Yeah. Una muerte aquí, aunque nunca nadie sabe ni se preocupa qué pasó con esa persona, pero esa muerte tiene gran impacto en la sociedad, en la cultura, en ese pueblo y en esa familia. Hijo sin padre, mujer sin esposo, quién sabe qué pasa. No? Of the 3,000 bodies that we have found, about 2,000 have names. There are about, three, uh, about a thousand that we don't have a name. But, I, but now, they, now they're doing DNA sampling, you know, from, from families and from the bones. So now we'll be able to match those DNA samples and, and identify some people. But sometimes all we find is just one bone, and, is, and the bone could be there for 10 years. So it's very difficult to make a, a match just from one bone. Okay. We have struggled over time with how to examine these remains, what to do with the remains of people who we are not able to identify. We try to gather whatever information we can about them um, to compare against missing persons reports that we may receive, uh, up to including comparing DNA to family members if we are in contact with them to see if they're related to the remains that we've recovered. About 86% of the people that we found have been male, and most of them are in their 20s or 30s. This is a demographic of people that are crossing, usually for work or for family reasons, not with a large group of family members seeking amnesty. When they start crossing for this area and the desert is, is where they, most of the fatalities happen. And it's different reasons. They 
heat or the cold. Like it's very cold at night and it's very hot at the day. Nobody can carry enough water to survive uh, that trip. To me, it's so easy to connect because I'm coming from there, but it's also so hard to see like, uh, to see that people don't understand here. And it's, it's hard, every day is, it's a struggle because it's, it's, it's not easy. These people are dying and it's just injustice. Nobody should die that way. Nobody should lose their life trying to get a better life or trying to help their family. They are coming for, from countries that are in conflict and very damaged. So poor people there, they don't have any chances to survive. They basically are abandoned by their government so, and the violence. So it's, to me, many of these cases that I see every day, they are, they, they are going to die, die there anyway. They know the risks and they still do it. It's because there is something really bad happening there. el incremento de la violencia en los en Chilapa Guerrero. Los cadáveres fueron recogidos cerca del mediodía por el más reciente informe de la Naciones Unidas define secamente a Centroamérica como la región más mortífera del mundo, donde uno de cada 50 hombres morirá asesinado antes de los 31 años. Se habla incluso de un triángulo del norte entre Honduras, Guatemala y El Salvador. El triángulo norte de Centroamérica con una población de 31 millones de habitantes lidera junto con los países en guerra los índices de migración y criminalidad en el mundo. ¿Por qué emigran a Estados Unidos? Las razones son múltiples, como la dura violencia que azota a estos países y sobre todo la pobre situación económica que enfrentan. La mayoría de los migrantes enfrentan condiciones de pobreza estructurales, es decir, una falta de oportunidades tremenda, un abandono del Estado total en el cual verdaderamente consideran que una de las pocas opciones que tienen para mejorar es cruzar miles de kilómetros para tratar de cruzar la frontera con Estados Unidos. Pues no sé, empezar una vida mejor. Primero debemos esperar aquí, después te cruzas hacia allá y... Dos meses esperamos dos aquí. Dos meses esperamos aquí. Y cinco días allá en la casa, en la casa donde, no, donde nos entregamos. Cinco días. Uh -huh. Y de ahí nos pasa con migración americana. Y de ahí nos hace la pregunta que por qué pedimos asilo. Y ya les contamos eh, por qué venimos del país a pedir asilo aquí. Ya ellos miran, eh, eh, leen el caso de nosotros y ya nos dicen a nosotros eh, si somos, nos dan el asilo, sí o no. Y dicen que según, ¿verdad? Tampoco no sé, pero dicen que dos días, de dos días a tres días nos tienen ahí y ahí nos mandan para adentro. Donde la familia que nos va a recoger, que sea americana, que tenga papeles de americana. Sí. Para poder estar un rato en el hogar y nos tengan ahí. Ajá. Bienvenido a nuestra clase de inglés. Panchito va a estar seguro que no se me desmaye. <risa> Hablaremos en inglés y le diremos que repite las palabras en inglés. We are in Nogales, Sonora, which is right over the border from the United States. Good morning. 
Yesenia. Okay, morning. Please. Come on, Abigail. This shelter is called La Roca. Many years ago, when this was just getting started, our group of Samaritans came to help put this together. There are not nearly enough shelters in Nogales to take care of the asylum seekers who are coming. Many arriving from the Triangle, which is Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. Many, many people are coming from Guerrero because the gangs apparently have taken over. My name is Shura. So, you, good morning, Shura. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay. Is Good morning. Good morning. Tell me what you would do if you let your child go out to play. The chances of your seeing your child again were very minimal because they're going to be scarfed up by the gangs and by the cartel. Okay. Very good. So, I, 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 I know that many people in the United States have absolutely no idea of what is happening down here. And they only know what they read in the newspaper, most of which is fallacious. We can't trust these people, they're all drug addicts, and no one sees these people as human beings. They've become monsters in the eyes of so many people. Come with me to the border. You look into the faces of the people and the children that our policies are affecting so dramatically. How many people do you think want to leave their home and their country? Oh my goodness. Oh. Tenemos tres meses ya aquí en este en Sonora. Estamos esperando pues el tiempo que nos pasen para migración si deciden darnos el asilo o no. Llevo los papeles de mis niños, el de matrimonio. Llevo todo, pues no sé qué nos vayan a pedir. Gracias. De hecho, salí ahorita con mis niños. Ajá. Sí, a ver qué, qué dice el presidente, a ver si nos da el asilo. Más que nada por la seguridad de nuestros niños y el bienestar, porque pues por allá donde estamos pues está la delincuencia muy muy difícil, pues, y, y no queremos arriesgar a nuestros niños. You're in my heart. You are in my heart. Okay. So I will, I will see you. My mission is to do the very best that I can for the people and be very honest with them and tell them, you know, when, when I'm speaking to the migrants at the Comodoro, I say, do not cross by yourself. It is too dangerous. And tell them the pitfalls. And that's the best that I can do. And I wish that I could do more. And I, at this point, I can't, you know, other than giving them all a hug and telling them that I love them. There's a map put out by Humane Waters that it shows 3,000 red dots where people have died here in the Sonoran Desert. And when I saw that map, that's what sort of led me to this project, because I want to bring those red dots on the map. A map is an abstraction. It's not, it's not the territory. It's not the geographical location. It's just a map showing approximately where a person was found. You need the real topographical maps and the exact GPS locations to, to find the site.
Y este puntito rojo significa que ahí donde está esa cruz clavada murió un migrante que venía a los Estados Unidos buscando una migaja del sueño americano. Entonces, esto, como ves, todas las cruces tienen ese puntito rojo, porque este es el momento más importante. So let's say Alvaro wants to um, put up a new cross for people that died in uh, 2019. We can search those people. And then that pulls up um, all these red dots. So these are all remains that were recovered in 2019. Okay, so this person's right here that I already mentioned. And then you can see on this dot, all the remains that have been recovered in the vicinity where this, this man was. So different people use this information for different reasons. So, um, so there you have three different groups with different purposes looking at the same information. One group that wants to put out water to prevent deaths and they look where people are, are being found to know where to put water. They want to put water where people are dying to prevent more people from dying. One person who has more of a, just a remembrance um, type thing with, for the Samaritans to put out, you know, crosses, which is Alvaro. And then us who want to know if we have a new, a new death or if uh, additional portions of an older one. So just kind of interesting how very di groups with different focuses come together to use the same information. I came here from Colombia in the 1960s. I came here to go to school, to go to college. I came here legally. I came here by plane. I came to New York City, looking for the American dream like everybody else at the time. And I knew that I didn't have a future in Colombia because my family was very poor. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do much with my life. So I had to come here, just like most migrants. This is where you find what you're looking for. You know, this is the land of milk and honey. You know, this is the promised land. This is where you become somebody. This is what I do. This is this is my religion. This is my practice. This is my meditation. This is my opportunity to connect to the own losses in my own life and to be part of that migration because I am part of it. I'm one of them. One, I'm one of the lucky ones. The unluckies are the 3,000 that have died here, the 2,000 that have disappeared here, and the families that have been separated, and many, many, many more that we don't know about. coming to the desert every Tuesday for the past six years. 
I need people to help me with this. So I have volunteers, Samaritan volunteers, who help me carry water. We leave water out here. Where we put the crosses, we need to carry cement, concrete. Uh, we are about 35 miles north of the Mexican border. And every migrant that uh, comes from that area has to cross this road here. And there's no water. And, and there's no shade. You see, the trees don't have any shade here. There's no place for you to get out of the sun. And that kills you. And all we do is leave water, hoping that there are no more casualties, no more people dying here. This is the end of the road. Uh, we cannot drive anymore from here, so we are here, uh, probably not very far from the site and then we're gonna have to walk, just like the migrant who died here did. So we're pretty much gonna be walking the same area before this person dies. Let me see the GPS, see what we have. Me hi. Okay, uh, this person was found on February 5, 2018. Skeletal remains unidentified. Uh, we are very, very close to the, the area, to the site. We have 11 gallons of water altogether. So we need to save some for the next stop. Um, We are here to do something that is very close to my heart, to give someone a presence, to give someone a little bit of recognition that this person came a long way from home and died here, and the dream ended here. And I hope that the idea of the American dream doesn't die altogether, that it will perdure, that will stay because we need, we are a country of migrants and we need migration to renew our ideals and our notion of, of who we are as a country. Yeah. Be very careful here with these rocks. These are rattlesnakes here. Stay there. Don't move. I'm not. Stay put. I'm planted. Don't. Don't breathe. <laughs> People in in Latin America believe that when someone dies at that particular location, the spirit stays somewhere leaves the body and continues to hang there. And I'm hoping that my action by putting that marker there will in a way tell the spirits that or people who care about that we are humans with good intentions and that we have morals and that we care, that we are not people who are want to cause any suffering. Yes. A little bit of water here. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, we're going to be reading a poem, so please keep a minute, minute of silence here. And while, while, while she's reading that, reflect on your own in, losses in your own life. Connect them to this person here. This poem is called Desparecidos by Tom Sheldon. Desparecidos means disappear. Your changes have been saved. We need to stop the carnage that we cannot continue to let people in their 20s and 30s die here because you shouldn't be dying at that age. You shouldn't be dying when you're 20. You shouldn't be dying when you're 30. And you shouldn't be dying looking for the dream that this country advertises as. As here is where you find it. That's why they call it the American dream. But now it's not a dream, it's a nightmare. The cry of the children. Do ye hear the children weeping, O my brothers, ere the sorrow comes with years? They are leaning their young heads against their mothers, and that cannot stop their tears. The young lambs are bleeding in the meadows. The young birds are cheap chirping in their nest. The young fawns are playing with the shadows. The young flowers are blowing toward the west. But the young, young children, oh my brothers, they are weeping bitterly. They are weeping in the playtime of the others, in the country of the free.